So now that we get the sense of what eternity is like, and we realize that this whole body analogy means that we are knit together, each with individual functions that logically relate to our actual life down here. Once we get that sense, the question becomes, how do I live now? Because what you're really doing now is training for your future role then. Every decision that I make, like right now I'm recording, is going to have an impact on what I will be and how God will use me in eternity. That's one reason I'm doing this, actually. If we are slated to be kings, one of the things about kingship is that you have to rule yourself. And you cannot afford to just buy into anything somebody else says. You have to rule on it yourself. So, I can't just buy, for example, what my pastor says, or what you say, or what the TV says. I have to investigate it, and learn it, and think it out, which is what I'm doing when I talk. In order to come to a decision about what it is, and then rule on it, and then try to live by what I rule. That's what a king has to do. And he's not just doing it for himself, he's doing it for his kingdom. That's what the head does. The head sets the rules. The head tells everything else what to do. Well, how's it going to do that if it doesn't know? Right from wrong, good from bad, up from down. And you got to analyze those things. You can't just say, well, this is right and this is wrong. You have to know why and what and in what context. Because the thing that's right in one context is wrong in a different context. There are times, and this is what, you know, Proverbs was saying, there's a time to be born, a time to die, a time to kill, a time to make peace. Okay, but under what times? What are the times? Under what context? Okay, that's a ruling decision. And you get Bible doctrine in your head so that you can learn how to make those decisions. That's what you're doing down here. Every decision you make. And then your body, your brain, is storing all that up. And then it gives you like a little urge to do the same decision the next time a similar situation arises. That's why sin is so insidious. Because once you do a sin, it sets up an urge to do it again when the same or similar situation arises. And it becomes easier to do it the next time because you did it before. That's why sin is something that you have to fight. Because once you do it, it sets up an urge to do it again. It's like an addiction. The same thing with Bible doctrine. The minute you apply Bible doctrine correctly, that memory and those associations and all the context will come back to you again the next time you're in a similar situation. At which point you have to choose between the doctrine that you applied rightly and some other option. If you choose the other option, then it comes back up the next time. And the, the Bible answer that you did the rightly the first time, well, that'll come up too, but it'll be a weaker urge. Because the latest one is always the strongest. The most repeated one is always the strongest. So by the time you've, d you've died, you have exercised your will strongly in X, Y, Z, B, N areas pro or con Bible doctrine. And God already foreknows how that's going to be. He's already set up a place for you in the eternal society. Okay, but that's then. This is now. If I look back on my life so far, there are a whole bunch of things I have chosen that I wish I didn't choose. I wish I had gotten serious about doctrine sooner. I wish that there's a whole bunch of activity I did that I wish I didn't pay so much attention to, like what I looked like, whether people liked me. And they did. 
and I did and it's like well, whoop de do what's that worth now nothing I could have been studying doctrine instead how many hours did I stand in front of a stupid mirror trying to get my hair right oh but I was young and pretty and everybody liked it when I looked good so I don't do that now that's one reason I don't make face videos anymore either. Now, and I'm happy now. Guess what? When you use doctrine instead and you spend your time on the doctrine instead, and sometimes, yes, it obeys Bible doctrine to stand there and make your hair look good. I'm not saying there's never a time. But when you're coordinating with the doctrinal application to your life, then you're getting double benefit. The thing that you wanted to do that pleases the world, but you're doing it because of the doctrine. Well, that latter is what's going to remain. And the former dies anyhow. Okay, so what do I think now? What should I do now, today, that will set up that eternal treasure? That's how you make your decisions now. And you might say, well, I don't know. I don't know Bible well enough. Okay, try. And you'll fail, okay? Just t take it as a given. You'll fail. You'll say that you're doing it in the name of the doctrine, but really you're doing it in the name of something else. <laughs> Keep trying to do it because of the doctrine you think you know. You'll twist that doctrine, but, some, but not 100% of the time. You'll twist your motive, but not 100% of the time. And at least you're asserting it as a motive. And then when you're screwing up and really doing it for some other reason, God will spank you and let you know. Or you'll just, he'll just let you know, and then you'll want to spank yourself. Not going to do any good to do that. Just get back on the horse. Over and over and over. Right now. Should you be listening to this audio? Maybe not, ask God. If you're not, then shut it off. Go do whatever he wants you to do instead. See what I'm saying? Should I be talking? Well, yeah, right now. Because this is my big problem in spiritual life. The thing that I'm advocating is the thing I'm not doing. Ha ah, ha. Do as I say, not as I do. What I got to realize, and that's why I'm making this audio, because I'm poster boy, okay. What I got to realize is, hi, I got my slot on the team. I can only see my life, really. Everything else is just like a movie. And I can try to learn from what other people are, are going through. But the bottom line is, how much time do I spend just having my own vertical life with God? With the stuff I got to do versus any horizontals with other people. Now, bear in mind that a lot of the vertical life with God has a horizontal, um, what do you want to call it, face. A horizontal function. You're doing the dishes because you're supposed to. You're paying your bills because you're supposed to. You're getting your car clean because you're supposed to. You're buying groceries because you're supposed to. You're in the boardroom discussing a $20 billion deal because you're supposed to. But your reason for being there is due to your vertical relationship with him. Not due to the horizontal itself. That's the difference. So notice it doesn't matter what kind of job you have. It doesn't matter what your role is vis-a-vis -vis society. You could be at the top. Okay? And I feel sorry for you if you are at the top because there's so many hypocrites up there with all their glitter that's really boring. It's totally, utterly boring. I cannot think of a worse place to be in this world than at the top of it. By the same token, at the bottom of it, it's like, ugh. Because people have no standards there. Or if they do, it's so heartbreaking to watch them have their standards and yet have nothing. 
In other words, it's just hard to be here horizontally at all. But if you have a vertical relationship with God, he can turn lemons into lemonade. Okay, God, how do I do this? I got to go to this expensive ball and put on my $10,000 earrings and smile at everybody who could care less. They're all there to just be impressed and everybody's really just thinking about how he looks and being nice in order to be nice. How do I go there? What kind of lemonade do you want to make out of this? And of course, I don't know the answer to that. But I'm asking the question, and I'm using 1 John 1 9 while I go, and I sit in that freaking limousine until I get there, and there's the red carpet, and I walk out and smile at everybody with all the cameras, you know, clicking away. Bored out of my head, but I have to smile. Seems hypocritical. But God has a reason for me getting out of that. God has a reason for me walking on that red carpet. And I smile because I'm supposed to. Dad, please make something out of all this hypocrisy. And he will. Or, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night because a cockroach just walked across your toe. And it's like, oh, please, God, how, do I, how are you going to make good out of this? I'm in all this squalor and I can't get out of it. He'll make good on it. You have no idea how. But you asked him. Instead of getting upset about it, and it's an upsetting situation either way, you asked him. Instead of just regarding your own life in your own little narrow perspective, you're trying to look at the bigger picture. You're trying to see a bigger. You have absolutely no idea what your role can do for the whole. But there's got to be one. Because God sees it. See the difference that makes? And this is what I got to learn too because I'm sitting here not wanting to do a whole bunch of things I ought to do. Because I don't see the connection to doctrine. But the connection is I ought to do them. He'll make good on it. So that's how I get through the day. Isaiah 54 1. Okay, I'm in this sterile activity now. You're going to make good on it. I have no idea how. And honey, you can be saying that no matter what occupation you got. I don't care if you're sitting down to a 24 karat gold plate dinner, allegedly in the name of charity, of course, or whether you're sitting in a rat infested tenement. God's going to make good on it. And none of that, I don't care if it's high or low, does him any good unless he makes good on it. So guess what? He's going to make good on it. And then here's the next point. Since you know he's going to make good on it, then you better do what you ought to do. Because it's like great big mousetrap game or a great big factory where every part of every part of every part of in the factory. I don't know if you've ever seen a factory before. But usually there's some product that's being made that goes along a kind of line. Or let's say a conveyor belt. Like a real good example of that that just hit my mind was in the, what was it, the movie The Hulk with Edward Norton? Where he showed the his blood got spilled into one of the bottles in a bottling plant. And you saw the bottles going down, going down, going down on the conveyor belt. Okay, a factory is like that. Something that's a problem 20 feet back is going to wreck what's going forward 20 feet in front. And that was exactly the premise of that movie was that a little bit of his blood got put into, you know, the orange drink or whatever it was in the Brazilian plant he was in. So everything you do is part of a whole and everything is connected. So if you aren't doing your job, the whole thing, you know, is, is flummoxed. Maybe not a lot and maybe not for long. But it's flummoxed. 
And it's really a hard thing to get used to. It's because most of us, if we're honest, feel isolated. Especially now. That's one reason why we're so attracted to our computers and so dependent on our mobile devices is that we all feel so isolated. Okay, but that's the way it's supposed to be. That's what we're not getting. The fundamental thing about the old sin nature is that it goes horizontal, herd bound. That was not the design. The design was vertical. You have a relationship to God and then my relationship to you is going through him. Think of an upside down V. And an upside down V looks like what? Hebrew or Greek L. Legs. Two of them. Two feet touching the bottom. Joined at the top. So you walk to the other person via God. Vertical to God, up. Then, vertical down to the other human. If we related to each other based on our relationship with God and not directly to each other, then life would be a lot better. So, I'm in my life, you're in your life, we're isolated. God likes to turn the sterile into productive, that's Isaiah 54, 1. If I keep looking at him while I do my dishes or take a shower or whatever, then he's going to turn that into something for you. And something for the next guy. And for whatever you do, and there's something for me. So then I don't worry about my relationship to you or anybody else horizontally. All I need to worry about is my relationship to him. That was the design. Pre-sin, that was the design. So post-sin, that's how everybody thinks. Look at all those conversations that are recorded between Christ and other humans between the angels and the humans. The angels are all preoccupied with God. They say really nice things to the people they talk to or really nasty things. But they're all saying it based on God. It's horizontal because it's vertical first. When Christ talks, it's all about Father. The horizontal is based on vertical first. So my cog in the wheel, my part in the factory of human life and human happiness and human progress is something God alone can make work. And if I don't do my job, then you're going to be hurt. I don't want that. If you don't do your job, then I'm going to be hurt. You don't want that. And at the same time, that's what we're training for in the eternal state. Our interdependence works if God is running the show. In the eternal state, he will be. Down here, well, it's votable. So I got to vote for him to run my life so it'll be good for your life. And that is a God deed, not a good deed. See the relevance?